Today's video is about low-dose naltrexone and how it works in the body. More specifically, I am going to go through the pharmacology of low-dose naltrexone and what receptor it interacts with. If we are meeting for the first time, my name is Dan. I am a pharmacist at MD Custom RX, and I have been an independent pharmacist now for 19 years. If you stick with me to the end of today's video, I will be sharing with you one very important tip for those that are either on low-dose naltrexone or are considering to starting it. Let's get into today's content. Biological mechanisms involved with opiates. So we have to understand what opiates do in the body so that we understand what naltrexone does in the body. Opioid uh, mechanism. So opiate medications have similar effects as to those naturally occurring neuropeptides. These neuropeptides are given the name endorphins. So we'll go back to morphine, take it as a painkiller. We don't have that pain perception anymore. Our body is naturally producing its own painkiller. It's not morphine, it's endorphins, attaching to those same morphine receptors. So if we could will it in our bodies, we could just tell ourselves, let's release more endorphins and then my pain will go away. Endorphin subclass called beta endorphins, and this isn't, you have to get super, I'm, I apologize, I'm getting too geeked out here on the pharmacology. They're made in the anterior, anterior pituitary, that's really not important. They're released into the body. Endorphins exert pain relieving effects in both the peripheral, so outside of your brain, and all over your body. So these endorphins, yes, they're the happy, good, feel good, get the dopamine rush, like a runner's high kind of effect. You're gonna feel that. Um, but then in your extremities, if you get endorphin release, you're gonna also not feel pain like if you get a burn or something like that or some kind of trauma. You're gonna block the pain both in your brain from those endorphins and you're gonna block it at the site of, of the trauma. So that's where you're getting to this, what's the peripheral nervous system that's outside of your brain and your spine, your central nervous system, I think of my brain and my spine. Opiates bind to the presynaptic terminal in the, outside the body or outside the brain, thus preventing the release of substance P I'll get to this in just a moment. Pain signaling is blocked and or down-regulated. So when opioids bind to the receptor, the substance P is suppressed. And so then we don't feel pain. Don't look at this right now. So look, think of these neurons. You know, you got one over here, you got one over here. The one over here is sending a message this way. That's the that's the, this guy over here, this pre, I should have like uh, props, sorry. But you've got the, the presynaptic neuron, it's gonna be sending some type of message downstream. And it does that, it releases the substance P and then you've got, you've got pain. Then this other nerve picks up the pain signal and we perceive pain. Now, if we take morphine, let's say, well you keep using that as an example, that's going to, uh, well, here, I gotta step back a little bit because I'm gonna get ahead of myself. Our body will normally release a natural painkiller called an endorphin. What can happen though, so, uh, so this beta endorphin is released. Opioids block that, that receptor right here. And so what ends up happening is you are, you're basically blocking this nerve from sending this pain signal. That makes sense. And I'm gonna, I'll circle back to this in just a minute. Um, so, opioid receptors in the central nervous system inhibit pain by modifying the release of a neurotransmitter called derp dopamine. So now I'm switching, let me go back. This Substance P can happen in the periphery. When we get into the, outside the brain, we've got, a, instead of having substance P around, we've got dopamine around. So. Opioid receptors in the central nervous system inhibit pain by modifying and releasing neurotransmitters called dopamine. Dopamine is a happy, feel-good neurotransmitter. If we have more dopamine moving around, we're not going to feel as much pain. Dopamine release is controlled by another neurotransmitter called GABA. So we actually have GABA right behind me here. So you can actually buy this right over the counter. And what that's going to do is, as it says, GABA inhibits dopamine release. Opioids cause a reduction in GABA release. So we've got to keep that in mind. So it's a little bit counterintuitive. Um, you know, do we want to uh, 
inhibit dopamine and not feel good. Uh, so opiates cause a reduction of GABA release. And so the end result, you've got more dopamine being released. When there's more dopamine, there's less pain. And in turn, there's more euphoria. Did I lose anyone yet on that? <laughs> it's a lot to explain. I think I tried to make another sl slide on that. Um, so the opioid receptor, so you've got an opioid receptor on this GABA nerve. Uh, when it's activated, there's less GABA release. When there's less GABA release, I can get more dopamine to the postsynaptic nerve. When I get an increase in dopamine, which is my happy feel good neurotransmitter, I have less pain. So less GABA, more dopamine release. Now you would think less GABA, more dopamine release. So why am I taking more GABA? <clears throat> so I don't want to get into that tonight, but you can just take GABA as an inhibitory neurotransmitter that just gives us a calming effect. It's not going to make you feel more pain. I can tell you that. But we're not going to get into that mechanism tonight. When I talked about morphine, think of morphine as an activating drug. It's going to block or it's going to activate that receptor and it's going to cause pain reduction. So that's what I call an extreme activator. It's going to think of it as a lock and key. Here's your, your morphine. It's going in and entering into the receptor and now we don't feel pain anymore. But we also get a high from that too. A partial agonist, it slightly activates this receptor but not to an extent like we'll keep using morphine as, uh, as the as example. An antagonist has no activation, so it might actually enter into the key, and we might think it's going to have an effect, but it just sits there and doesn't open up the lock. So that's, that's blocking the pain signal, or I shouldn't say it's blocking the pain signal. It's blocking whatever action we might be wanting it to do. So th just keep, keep that in mind, and keep in mind what a partial agonist, it, it somewhat stimulates that receptor. It doesn't do a great job, but it, it moves it a little bit. So endorphins are agonists, and think of endorphins as is activating, and that's a good thing. Morphine, and there's a lot of other drugs that are out there, are also agonists, but they do come with side effects, and we know that. We'll talk a little bit about that. Now, trexone and naloxone are both antagonistic. They block that receptor. So now your endorphins can't attach to that receptor, nor can morphine attach to that receptor. So you'd think you're actually your pain would go up. And in theory, your pain could go up a little bit. Endogenous opiate peptide activity. So morphine activates, causes pain to not be transmitted. Let's just keep it simple. These peptides, endogenous peptides, these endorphins, they, I mean, there's, they're all over the body. Uh, they act as a neurotransmitter. They regulate growth, they improve cell repair, they stabilize the immune system, they give us this overall sense of well-being. Again, I kind of think of that runner's high effect when we're just exerting ourselves extremely, you know, to a high physical level. That rush of endorphins is giving you that, that high. It's, it's causing that dopamine to be released as well in our brains. There are subtypes of these opioid receptors. So yes, they're helping to control pain, but they're helping to control a gazillion everything, ever, things in our body. So there's not that, again, that this matters. There's four different subtypes. There's different levels of them at different areas of the body. We have mu receptors, delta, kappa, and this OGFR, which is this opioid growth factor receptor. That's important to note because when you get into things like cancer, building bone tissue, that's where that receptor comes into play. So understanding, I'm gonna just give a general overview of naltrexone now. It's a nonspecific, so here, uh, kind of some take home points. It's a, it's a long acting opioid receptor antagonist. Can bind to all four different receptors, opioid receptors in the body. However, at low dose, this long acting effect of this drug goes away. So that's a take-home point. Uh, other pharmacists, other doctors, they might say, now Trexone doesn't have that ability to just attach to one receptor for only four to six hours. Well, if you look at the pharmacokinetics of a 50 milligram or 100, 200, 300 milligram dose of naltrexone, 
That's true. It sits on that receptor for a very, very long time. Unlike most medications, naltrexone has a bit of different pharmacology and kinetics with it at lower dose. Don't know exactly why that is. It is what it is at this point. What we, what we can say about that we know when you're under about six milligrams, you only get about a four to six hour blockade of that opioid receptor. It's a very short period of time. And that's one of those things to kind of keep in the back of our mind is that this drug is only working in our body for, again, at best six hours. Uh, decreases inflammatory cytokines. I talked about this already. It's approved at 50 milligrams. And the molecular weight, not that this all matters, uh, except for patients that are using this topically. Now, Trexone can actually penetrate the skin quite easily. So anything under 500, you can run that drug through the skin. Um, you don't even really have to use um, skin penetrators. So this one is well below that 500 mark of molecular weight. So we actually use, and we'll see this later on in application, you can actually use low-dose naltrexone in a topical cream to help with itching, psoriasis, those kind of topical inflammatory issues. Mechanism of action for low-dose naltrexone. So many diseases and expressions are a malfunction of the immune system. So these opioid receptors, again, the different subclasses, all over white, different white blood cells. They're, all, they're over our thymus gland. I pointed at my thyroid. Did you notice that? Where's my thymus gland? Some behind my sternum. <laughs> okay. Somebody's paying attention. They get an extra point. Um, the immune system is regulated um, largely by endorphins, so that happy, good, feel-good neurotransmitter. They have a primary action on opioid receptors. So when we start to modulate opioid receptors, we start modulating our immune system because those opioid receptors, not just blocking pain now, they're controlling our immune system, upregulating it, downregulating it. Blocking opioid receptors briefly, so that four to six hour kind of period, causes uh, LDN uh, to create an upregulation in the production of endorphins, which I call it immune modulating. When LDN sits on that opioid receptor for only four to six hours, essentially what's happening in the body really doesn't know what's going on in my mind. It seems like, well, you know, there's a certain rate these endorphins that are producing are, are being produced in our body throughout the day and they're being released. And then all of a sudden, you know, there's a signal going, well, where's that endorphin? It's not attaching to the opioid receptor. I'm not getting that little dopamine hit that I want. What's going on here? So the body's like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some more endorphins. Something must be wrong here. So I'm just going to start upregulating endorphin, endorphin production. When that LDN goes away after about four to six hours, that's kind of when the magic happens. That's kind of like, oh, you were stockpiling it. Something was going on with the receptor. It was blocked. And then that activates the immune system, but not necessarily in a bad way or it doesn't overactivate it. It balances it out. So furthermore, cell growth is also mediated by a subtype of endorphins. This has to do more with cancer. So cell growth or cell, in, uh, cell inhibition, cell growth inhibition. And this is a, this application, again, for some types of cancer. So we're not going to get deep into the, into the cancer talk tonight, but just know if there's somebody out there that has cancer, there are multiple different studies that are being done uh, using LDN to actually help improve the chemotherapy that a patient is on so they can actually lower the dose of the chemotherapy, which is very helpful because a lot of times these chemotherapy agents are very toxic. So we have to be careful with that. That was a lot of chemistry. If you're still with me, thank you. And as I promised at the beginning of this video, here is my one very important tip for anyone considering taking low-dose naltrexone or is currently on it. And that is simply this, avoid gluten at all costs. It makes absolutely no sense to me why you would be on gluten and naltrexone at the same time. Now, low-dose naltrexone will still work if you're taking gluten or consuming wheat and so forth. However, gluten upregulates an inflammatory pathway in the body. That same pathway, low-dose naltrexone is trying to downregulate. So we have opposing forces. Gluten is increasing in inflammation in the body, where low-dose naltrexone is trying to decrease inflammation via that same pathway. In next week's video, I will be sharing with you the many health benefits of low-dose naltrexone. As always, if you found value in today's content, I encourage you to subscribe to our channel and share this with a, a loved one. Thank you.